Hi, everybody. I'm Diane Brady. I am here with John Katzenmatidis, who is, of course, owner, president, chairman, and CEO of uh, Gristides, also the Red Apple Group. I see you're wearing your WABC pin. You have a great show. And you're author of, I'm looking at it over there, but it's How Far Do You Want to Go? Lessons from a Common Sense Billionaire. John, welcome. Thank you for having me. And uh, uh, there's so much to talk about. I, I, where do, where we do, start? do you want to start? Let's start with common sense. Like define what you mean by that. What's common sense? I think uh, when I des describe it in politics, I describe it as uh, everybody should have the right to talk, especially in our universities. Uh, I don't believe in extreme left wing. I don't believe in extreme right wing. I, feel, I believe that people should have a discussion and let the audience decide or let, or, or at the end of the day, come up with common sense solutions. Uh, it, it went back to, to Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill. They, they argued like heck, but at the end of the day, they did what's good for America. And that's important. Bill Clinton, Newt Gingrich, they didn't like each other. They argued like heck. But at the end of the day, they did what's good for America. I think those are the last two individuals, Bill Clinton, Newt Gingrich. The deficit was five and a half trillion. Yeah. Guess what? They took it down to five trillion. Who else would do that? Well, it's interesting. I mean, everybody blames technology. What do you think happened that took us in this direction of no middle ground, basically, certainly in politics? Something happened. I keep asking. And I, I, I think it happened mostly in the last 10 years. Um, and it, it, it's just mind boggling. Um, one person said to me, the senators used to stay in Washington and used to drink with each other, eat with each other. And all of a sudden, they're all going home on weekends or going home. Work-life balance destroyed us. <laughs> and, yeah, and, and to raise money and whatever. Yeah. Uh, I think there's way too much money being floated around Washington. Uh, I think the common sense in Washington is hurting. Uh, I am worried about foreign monies coming into Washington and having undue influence. And we're gonna lose our country unless we get control of where these monies are coming from and how they're influencing our Congress, our Senate, our executive office. And I'm really worried 20, well, we're in 2023 now, 20, uh, 26, I think is the 250th year of, of our country, and 2076 is the 300th year. If we are going the way we're going, I worry about my kids and grandkids. What is it that motivated you to get into politics at the city level? You, you know, running for mayor of New York. Why was that sort of your focus? Because you I, could have run, you could have gone to Washington, you could have... I know, wanted to level. make a difference. I love New York. I grew up in Harlem. Uh, you know, New York has given me and my family everything that we could have. And I just wanted to make a difference and do the right thing for New York because I love New York. And I was... Well... What would Ed Koch say, the former mayor? How am I doing? How am I doing? <laughs> but during the primary, I ran as a Republican liberal. Don't forget, I was a Bill Clinton guy. So running as a liberal, it's like Mike the, the likelihood was oh, that my Democratic friends will vote for me on the liberal line. And uh, I lost the Republican nomination because uh, uh, Rudy Giuliani's deputy mayor was running against me. So that I think I didn't really lose to the deputy mayor. I lost to Rudy Giuliani because they figured, the, the public figured that he knew what uh, he was doing when he picked him. Talk about the lessons of the book because I'm, I'm fascinated. You actually dropped out of NYU eight credits short. You know, I know that you were already an owner. Of, I didn't officially drop out. I just you just it short. didn't drop. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you didn't finish because the business case was very strong. That's that's actually a very modern thing to do because a lot of people are questioning the value of a university education. What advice do you have to young people starting out today? 
go to college. Yeah. Uh, try to learn, but you have to learn what you want to learn. Uh, a job is not a job. Work is not work if you enjoy what you're doing. So get into a, 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 a position that you really enjoy doing. That's the secret. I mean, I'm intrigued, but both, you know, in the book and then in your show and elsewhere, I mean, you, you talk about policies and as a business leader, let's start with the future of New York City. Are, are you optimistic right now? We've come through the pandemic. A lot of businesses, people have left. Do you think they'll come back? 484,000 people left in the last 24 months. Yeah. Mind boggling. And, and right now, they are still leaving. I had Tom DiNapoli, the controller of the state of New York, on my show a few weeks ago. He says, our budget is okay right now. But he's worried revenue. about year two, three, and four. Because if people keep living, and the people who are leaving are high-end uh, middle class millionaires, and who's going to pay? They're, they're coming up, the, the socialists, when they're coming up with higher and higher budgets. Who's going to pay for it? If they keep, people keep living, leaving. And uh, what I say to her, right now, the budget between New York State budget and New York City budget, where we're sitting right now, is almost $350 billion for 20 million people. You ready? You're sitting down? Florida, 22 million people. The budget is less than $114 billion. Yeah. Two to one, three to one. Where is the money going? Who's going to pay for it if people keep living, leaving? And, uh, and my other concern now is that uh, the attorney general is starting to do investigations on businesses. What are we going to do? We have the people, the consumers are leaving. And what are we going to do? We're going to chase our businesses out of New York State too? I mean, who's going to be left? You know, you're going to end up... What would you do as mayor? Albany, Albany. You're going to end up like downtown Detroit or downtown Cleveland. I don't want to say anything bad about Cleveland or Detroit, but that's where you're going to end up in New York State if they don't have some common sense. One thing that's interesting about your book um, is so much of your success is obviously raw talent plus hunger. And I am very fascinated with this particular generation. And it's hard to stereotype a generation, of course. But are you seeing in your own business or, or elsewhere the same hunger that you had that really drove you from a very young age? Some like yes. Build a business. Yeah, no. Some yes. Some no. You know, I've said uh, publicly, I've said, these kids that want to work three days a week, forget about it. They're not going to go nowhere. They're going to be failures in life. So if you think you're going to work three days a week and be a success in life, forget about Korea it. Korea just expanded its work week to 70-hour week. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, look, uh, when I was young, I used to work 70 hours, 80 hours a week. I, you know, when I went into business, what was my motto? Failure is not an option. If I had to work 140 hours a week, I would work 140 hours a week. But these kids have to learn that, that they can't go and live off of mommy and daddy. And that this Generation Z did a lot of that. They, they went home, lived off of mommy and daddy. And, and they're going to have more hunger, more hunger for success. And uh, uh, what, what I try to teach the kids in Harlem, because I came from Harlem, mm. and I go in the police athletic league, and I go visit them, and I go to the PAL centers, or I go to, during the holiday parties. And you know what I say to them? What? I made it. You can make it too. And I would sit there with the police commissioner of Bratton or police commissioner Kelly, and there was a hundred kids in that corner there, and I say, how many of these 100 can we save? Because I believe these kids need saving. And that's what I work very hard at, to try to raise money and save as many as we can. And a lot of these kids need somebody to put their arm on their shoulder and say, this is the right direction. What I say in the book is you reach many areas 
forks in the road. And you have to know if there's zig or zag, or zag or zig. And, and these kids have to learn that. And they have to have mentors to be able to, to advise them. I had many mentors when I was growing up. And I, I think I made the right decisions most of the time. And I want the people who read my book to, to realize that those decisions are going are, are to come up. And the other thing I tell young people or tell you can't win if you're afraid of losing. I'm thinking of the airline. That must would that qualify as what you'd consider your biggest failure? Well, I had a good time. I loved it. We I was running an airline. I was twenty uh, no thirty. How old was that? Thirty three years old. I was running an airline for the whole world, and you know we were flying the whole world. We did. We were like the tenth, eleventh largest carrier. And at that age, I, out of Smyrna, Tennessee, a suburb of Nashville, I learned so much. I would say, we didn't make much money, but I'll, I'll give you a secret. We did make money eventually because of the situation. When we sold the airline, when we saw People's Express enter our, our market, yep. we sold the Budget airline. carrier, yeah. And they owed us a lot of money, but we sold the, but we kept the airplanes as collateral. So the person we sold it to, poof, he went bankrupt. When we went back to bankruptcy court to recover our airplanes, guess what? That's when we found the oil company. So if I never would have sold the airline, if I never had the airline, I would have never found the oil company. Serendipity. Let me, I want to end on something that I think is, so I'm a Canadian and I've always, had great admiration for the U.S. and especially, the, I guess you'd say the American dream, this this belief that anybody can make it. One of the differences I see today is there's less of a belief that the playing field is fair. And I think there's some val validity to that. I mean, what do you think it will take, you know, as a business leader, as somebody interested in politics, to sort of create conditions where ambitious young people actually think they've got a chance. The harder you work, the more luckier you get. Still, you think? That you're still there, but you got to even work even harder. And that's important. And people have to realize that. Um, and location, location, location. I'm going to take New York as one. If you buy this building here, where we're sitting in, uh, 10 years ago, for a million dollars, I'm just throwing numbers out. In New York, because you have, if you want, you want to sell it, you have 20 other buyers. In 10 years, you might sell it for five or 10 million. If you buy this building in Kansas City, in Boise, Idaho, for a million dollars, guess what? How many buyers you have for Kansas City? How many buyers? So location, location, location. Being able to buy, and sell, the, and, and, and I think that's another secret in life, to be able to, 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 to pick and choose. So the book is How Far Do You Want to Go? Lessons from a Common Sense Billionaire. John, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed this interview. And if you read the book, I guarantee you're going to make at least a billion. <laughs>